I trust that this last week has been one of trying to sort out the upcoming semester. I guess trying to sort out your timetable. Which classes to take? Do I do them online or in person? As well as gathering with others from within your EU faculty. Hopefully as you make some decisions about what to commit to this semester, you'll also be making some really wise decisions about how to love and care for those within your EU faculties by creating some space in your week to be attending faculty gatherings, coming to Bible study and meeting to pray with others. Well, this week is the third and final talk in our three-week series on proclaiming the kingdom. Today, we turn to Acts chapter 13 and consider how the proclamation of the Apostle Paul continues God's great kingdom expansion plans, which started in Jerusalem and are heading through Judea, Samaria, and over to the ends of the earth. This particular section of the Acts narrative in Acts chapter 13 finds Paul in the city of Antioch as part of his first missionary journey. Here, Paul, himself a Jew, goes first to the synagogue and in verses 15 to 33, gives a brief articulation of the history of God's faithfulness in his dealings with Israel. I'd encourage you to go back to the beginning of Acts and read carefully through the narrative up until now. In doing so, hopefully you'll be reminded of the content of the gospel that is proclaimed by many of these early apostles. And hopefully you will also see that the content of Paul's gospel's proclamation is consistent with the proclamation of others, like Peter, whom we saw last week and the week before, and Stephen. I've listed here some key elements of Peter's proclamation from Acts 2 and 10, which we've considered over the last two weeks. Do you notice here that as we read through Acts chapter 13, that there were similarities that Paul has as to the content of his gospel proclamation? Some of the key elements that are common to both Peter and Paul's include the historical aspect of the work of God within Israel, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the offer of forgiveness, and that in Jesus, he is both Lord and Christ. See, here in Acts chapter 13, Paul speaks of many of the same aspects of the work of God in his gospel proclamation. So what might we conclude by this? Well, from those early days of Jesus being raised to life and appearing to and commissioning these apostles, we see that the proclamation of the gospel is consistent. Even though Paul was not with Jesus during his life, nor with Jesus in those days immediately following his ascension, Paul saw the risen Jesus, was converted, and was commissioned to be an apostle to the Gentiles. You can go and read more about that in Paul's account in Galatians chapter 1 and 2. And the gospel that Paul proclaims has at its core those same key elements that we have already seen in the previous weeks in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. The question we should ask is, is this the gospel that we proclaim? For as we consider what it means for us to be proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus, we do well to be reminded of the gospel that these early apostles proclaimed. Now, the reminder we get in verses 32 to 39 is that at the heart of Paul's message is a declaration that what was promised to the Jews, that promise of resurrection, is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. As we saw in Acts chapter 2, Paul reminds his hearers that while David saw death, his descendant Jesus did not see corruption, but was raised to new life. And in the death and resurrection of Jesus, forgiveness from sin before God is possible. And it is this offer, notice there in verse 38 of forgiveness, that is made when the resurrected Jesus is proclaimed. But to whom is the audience that this is proclaimed? Well, we see that from verse 16, Paul is addressing the people of Israel. And as he recounts the narrative of God's dealing with humanity, in verses 17 and following, and then again in verse 26, we see that God deals predominantly with Israel as his chosen and dearly loved people. And as such, it is to the Jews that the offer of salvation and forgiveness in Jesus first comes. But as we saw last week, God does not show partiality. And Paul recognizes this when in verses 38 and 39 he says, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes 
is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. See, this offer of forgiveness, first offered to the Jew, is now made available to all people. The offer of forgiveness is available to everybody. And it is an offer that frees people from their enslavement to sin. An offer made to people from all tribes and all nations. And this great offer should spur us to action. An action that seeks an opportunity to proclaim to those from any tribe or nation whom we come in contact with. Consider our local context. Within our Sydney University community, there are students from hundreds of countries, tribes and languages from all around the world. Many come as international students. Many come as locals with their families having emigrated to this country. And the offer of forgiveness in Jesus is one that many are yet to hear. And yet here they are. Will we be willing to be bold and seize opportunities to proclaim that Jesus offers them forgiveness? Should it come as a surprise to us that God offers forgiveness to the Gentiles? Now, the Apostle Paul, having been a well-trained Jew prior to his conversion, obviously thought that many Jews would be surprised by such a claim. In light of Paul's claim that by Jesus, everyone who believes is freed in verse 39, Paul gives those listening a warning here in verses 40 to 41. Now, what is it that Paul is referring to? Well, Paul here in verse 41 draws on a quote from Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. At this time in Israel's history, well after David had fallen asleep and been lain with his fathers, God was bringing judgment against the two remaining southern tribes of Israel. And God's means of judgment against their ongoing disobedience was to raise up the Babylonians, a dreaded and fearsome force of invaders. This was the prophecy that was given to the prophet Habakkuk. And it was an astounding promise that God was raising up a nation to bring judgment against his own people. And in Habakkuk's time, this promise came about. And the two southern tribes of Israel were taken into captivity and Jerusalem, God's holy city, was destroyed. And it is from this same city of Jerusalem that God does another astounding, almost unbelievable thing. In the death and resurrection of his own dear son, he offers forgiveness, not just to his own people, the Jews, who had continued to rebel against him for generations, whom he sent into exile, but more than that, he offers forgiveness to those who were not part of his chosen people. He offers forgiveness to Gentiles. Likewise, we ought not to be surprised when people become Christians. God has promised that he will save people from many tribes and many nations, so don't be surprised when God makes good on his promise and saves people. Sometimes he will do it in astounding ways, through unexpected people, perhaps like you and me, through unexpected circumstances, like even during the time of COVID lockdown. We've here heard of stories of people becoming believers or through unexpected relationships. The person whom you meet next week in an online class, whom you perhaps end up building a relationship with and sharing Jesus with and then is converted. Friends, do not be surprised that God works in astounding ways. After all, he did the most astounding thing. He brought Jesus back from the dead and offers forgiveness to Jew and Gentile. So how will people respond to the proclamation of the gospel? Well, the response to Paul's proclamation is that the people strongly desire to hear more, notice there in verse 42. But the response is also one of resistance to the proclamation of Jesus as the Messiah, in whom is resurrection. Notice the Jewish leader's response in verse 45, they're filled with jealousy. Uh, presumably this is because Paul has managed to gather the whole city to hear the proclamation concerning Jesus, and the Jews are angry and jealous. But this doesn't deter Paul. In fact, he reminds us here, as there in verse 46, of the necessity that the gospel be proclaimed first to the Jew, and then due to their rejection of God's message, not unlike their ancestors, who kept turning aside from trusting God's word to them, Paul indicates he will take this message to the Gentiles. 
Now, one of Paul's justifications for this claim is that he sees himself and his com um, comrade Barnabas as the fulfillment of the prophecy quoted here from Isaiah 49. It is a wonderful prophecy of restoration and salvation, of people being brought back to God. It is a striking claim here that Paul sees his ministry of proclamation to the Gentiles being prophesied in Isaiah. Clearly from verses 48 and 49, we see that the distinctive of Paul's preaching is that the Gentiles are to be included in salvation. And what response does this produce? Well, as we've seen, the response is division. Firstly, notice there are some in verse 48 who rejoice and glorify God. Not surprisingly, upon hearing that Gentiles can be saved and be included in the promises of God, these Gentiles respond with great joy. But secondly, the other aspect of division is that the Jews stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Notice there in verse 50. And they seek to drive them away from the city. Why shouldn't we be surprised at this particular response? Remember, you see it back in Jesus' lifetime, when some choose to follow him, but others seek to kill him. You see it in the ministry of Paul throughout his life, as Gentiles receive the gospel with joy in the Holy Spirit, but he is often rejected, as is his message, by many Jews who refuse to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. We often also, I take it, see it in our own experiences, as we proclaim that in Jesus is the resurrection and some will receive it with joy, but others will scoff and reject the proclamation we make of God's great gospel. But this response should not deter us from being bold in taking opportunities to proclaim Jesus to the nations. For as the proclaimed word goes out, there will be some who will reject it, but there will be others for whom it brings great joy in conversion. And as they receive the Holy Spirit, they will give glory to God in heaven. And we can rejoice with them in knowing that we have, as Paul would write later in 1 Corinthians 3, been fellow workers with God in his great harvest field. So friends, today, can I encourage you to remember God's word, as quoted by Paul there in verse 47. For so the Lord commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It is this message of repentance the promise of forgiveness and eternal life, and the urgency of this declaration that has been proclaimed to the ends of the earth, to both Jew and to Gentile. Look back through recent years to see this as evidence. And it is this message that we continue to proclaim to our campus. This is the great announcement for our day and age, the gospel that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. And it is this gospel that the EU has been declaring for the last 90 years, and continues to do so this year. So can I encourage and urge you to be bold in your faith and in your proclaiming of the kingdom, for it is a kingdom that is unshakable. And so then our role in God's great kingdom project is that having been saved in Jesus' death and resurrection, we now proclaim that God has appointed Jesus as judge of the living and the dead. So brothers and sisters, be bold have the confidence of knowing that the message that we speak is God's message, the message that gave us salvation. It is a message of forgiveness that demands a response to the claim that Jesus is the risen Lord, that he will judge the world, that he offers forgiveness to all, Jew and Gentile alike, who repent of their sins and place their trust in him.